very good news for you. Three good bits of news. One, I'm going to get off this stage in just a moment. Number two, this is arguably the most perfect time to be doing a seminar about New Orleans drinking, which is to say early in the morning. I think that will be something dear to your hearts. And number three, I just checked in the other room, and this is, as we start right now, the very first seminar of Tales on Tour Edinburgh. Yay! <laughs> So welcome to the assembly rooms. Thank you all for getting here as early as you did today. I understand there was a few parties last night, so if you managed to get to any of them like we did, again, congratulations on being here. My name is Philip Duff. I'm the direction, the, the editor, okay. The director of education there for Tales of the Cocktail. I've been able to put together a great program for all the seminars here, and this was one of the most highly rated seminars last year in New Orleans. We have a truly stellar panel of bartenders here who are usually so busy working during Tales in New Orleans that we don't get to see as much of them as we'd like. This has all been made possible by the Sazerac Company, a company with long roots of history in New Orleans and their UK distributor, High Spirits. So I want to say a big thanks to you and to the brands that you'll see on stage and in the cocktails, brands that include Peychaud's Aperitivo and of course the eponymous Sazerac Rye as well as Herb Saint. And I won't be giving too much away if I say that the person leading the seminar, whose idea it was, the uh, award-winning author, Philip Green is actually a direct descendant I'm of right. Antoine Amadie okay. Peshaw. So, Mr. Green. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next to him is perhaps New Orleans' most famous living bartender. Somebody said once that Chris McMillan right? doesn't know a lot about 18th century bartenders. He is an 18th <laughs> century bartender, arguably the most famous mid-julep bartender in the world and owner and patron of the incredible Rebel Cafe in New Orleans. Mr. Chris Miller. Thank you very much. And rounding things out, perhaps one of the most recognizable bartenders you'll see in New Orleans during Tales of the Cocktail, somebody who epitomizes the class and elegance and bartending trade of the place he calls his home, the French 75 bar, Chris Hanna. Thank you. The Cocktail Apprentices will be bringing out the first drink very quickly. I'm gonna hand over to Phil Green. Please tweet and hashtag and Instagram and all that sort of thing using Tales on Tour. And let me welcome you to New Orleans, the cradle of civilized drinking. Uh, it's, it's really an honor to be here. Uh, Chris and I have been doing New Orleans cocktail seminars. Chris McMillan and I, since uh, 2005, I think, uh, six, 2006, and it's it's great to to have Chris Hanna join us this year. Um, I'm always honored to to be in the company of real bartenders. I'm just a make believe bartender. Uh, my day job is at the Pentagon. Uh, don't hold that against me, please. Um, but thank you for coming out. Um, and again, we want to thank our sponsors, Peychaud's, uh, the Sazerac Company, Peychaud's Bitters, Peychaud's Aperitif, and now the the beautiful glass you have in front of you. Um, is a fairly new product that came out in 2015, uh, Peixos Aperitivo. If you're familiar with Campari, if you're familiar with Aperol, uh, this is a, a delightful Aperitivo in that same family of products. It, it's imported from Italy um, and it's available here. In fact, they have a couple of delicious cocktails at Bramble, which is just around the corner on Queen Street. Uh, you might want to try them out. But um, so cheers, uh, it's a nice way to start the day. Slancha. Slancha. Um, all right, so we're going to start talking today about that greatest of all New Orleans cocktails. Of course, I refer to the hand grenade. Uh, if you ever go to New Orleans, do not have one of these. This is, this is, this is in here as a joke, and I can tell you're all laughing riotously. Um, now, we're, we'll start by talking about the Sazerac. Uh, this is a caricature that my friend Jill DeGroff uh, did of me. But uh, the Sazerac is, is a multifaceted drink, a uh, historic drink, and I start by talking about the three faces of Eve or the three faces of the Sazerac. Uh, it's, it's like the, uh, the, the, the parable about the elephant and the blind men. It, it depends on which, which part of it you're looking at. Um, one, one story that you'll hear in New Orleans if you go and you take the New Orleans cocktail tour or if you read certain books 
that it was the first cocktail ever, that the Sazerac was the first cocktail and that the cocktail was invented in New Orleans. Uh, this is from a, a 1937 book called uh, Famous New Orleans Drinks and How to Mix Them by Stanley Clisby Arthur. He tells the story of Antoine Peychaud, who is my ancestor. Actually, my, I'm not a direct descendant. My great-great-grandmother was Marie-Louise Peychaud. Her cousin was Antoine Peychaud. We descend from the same ancestor. Um, but according to, to Clisby Arthur's story, um, Peychaud was a pharmacist in the, in the French Quarter in the 19th century and used to serve Sazerac brand cognac in a little hourglass shaped egg cup, which in French is called a coquetier. And he would serve it with his bitters in this egg cup with a little bit of sugar. And as customers would walk into the shop, they would say, oh, what are you drinking there? What is that? And he, he would say, it's a coquetier, referring to the vessel. And the word co coquetier became blurred into cocktail. And that's where the word cocktail came from. And this was the first ever cocktail. So my ancestor allegedly invented both the term and, and the drink. So you, you see this, uh, the christening font of the cocktail, the story told many times over that the Sazerac, or what evolved into the Sazerac, was the very first cocktail. Now, it is true that uh, uh, my ancestor, Antoine Peychaud, was from the, the French colony of Saint-Domingue, which in the 1790s, there were violent, violent slave rebellions that ended around 1804, and many of the, 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 the French colonists were, were driven out of uh, Saint-Domingue uh, to Cuba, to Jamaica, to New Orleans, to Savannah, and elsewhere. Um, you can see on the map where, where Haiti is. Uh, I think this, yeah, so Saint-Domingue would be right here. So you had people going to Jamaica, to Cuba, and eventually up to New Orleans. Uh, Peixot was among those heading to New Orleans. Um, and he was just a baby. He was maybe a year old. He and his sister, last than he, were separated during the panic. So the parents got on a boat that went to Paris. He got on a boat that ended up in New Orleans and was probably raised by my great, 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 great grandparents and, and grew to adulthood. And he eventually was reunited with his sister, last than he. Um, he sent for her when he found out that she was in Paris. She came to, uh, she came to New Orleans on a ship uh, as the ship came up the river, he stood on the levee waiting for her. She was the first passenger to step on the plank and walk to the shore. As she did so, a gust of wind blew aside her skirt and revealed the most beautiful foot and ankle in the world. At least so thought a young man standing in the crowd to watch as the ship arrived. So my ancestors are responsible for two things. One, the cocktail, and two, flashing. You know, that, that phenomenon in New Orleans where women lift their skirts or their, or their tops. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, so let's look at the facts here. Uh, when did, when did Peychaud actually open his pharmacy? Was it 1800 thereabouts? Uh, well, no, he was just a baby uh, in 1804 when he came to New Orleans. It wasn't until 1832 that you see him going into business in a partnership with a man named Dukong. Um, and then in 18, 1834, he opens his pharmacy in Royal Street um, where, where he starts serving his uh, products. Now, in 1857, I, I found this newspaper from the New Orleans Bee. You see um, an advert, advert where he's bragging about how uh, this cordial has been introduced into general use at the Sazerac house. So that sort of puts the suspect at the scene. This proves that Peixot's bitters were used at the Sazerac house, which is where the drink evolved into the Sazerac cocktail. And I think here we have the Sazerac just now coming out. Um, this is what the, the building looks like today. It's, a, it's an antique uh, gun and sword and, and other shop. It's called Cohen's. And there you see uh, Chris Hanna, dapper as always, standing outside the entrance to, to Cohen's uh, shop. So was it the first cocktail? And that's what, that's what this book tells us in, 18, in 1937. Um, and, and this bit of folklore has persisted. You see this old advertisement for Glenmore whiskey. Um, this, these are newspaper stories from the 1930s claiming that this this drink that started as a cognac and bitters and sugar drink that evolved into a rye whiskey drink was the world's first cocktail. Um, so we, we only have to look to the 1806 newspaper, the, uh, the Balance in Columbia Repository from Hudson, New York. Here is the first time that the word cocktail is ever defined in print, 1806. Um, it's defined in a, in a story about an election that just occurred as spirits of any kind 
sugar, water, and bitters. It is said to be an excellent electioneering potion inasmuch as it fuddles the head as it makes the heart uh, stout and bold. It is said to be of especially good use for an excellent um, uh, electioneering uh, potion for a Democratic candidate because once you've swallowed a glass of, of cocktail, you're ready to swallow anything else. Um, <laughs> I, th I think it was the Republicans that did a lot of swallowing in our last election, but, but I digress. Um, anyway, so here you have the cocktail defined in 1806. So how is it that Peychaud was creating the cocktail uh, at age three years old? I, it, it just doesn't add up. Because when you look at Peychaud's obituary in 1883, this is the, the same New Orleans newspaper, the New Orleans Bee from 1883. Here's his um, um, obituary, his death notice, and it says, on the 30th of June, 1883, Antoine Peychaud passes away at the age of 80. So that shows that he was born in 1803. You can't have him uh, inventing the word cocktail right out of, right out of uh, after being born and then having the term show up in a New York newspaper. So we can pretty much convince ourselves that it's folklore that Peychaud was the inventor of the cocktail. Um, so here's how to make a cocktail, the Sazerac cocktail. I'm going to ask Chris... Chris Hanna to, to uh, show us how it's done. All right, <clears throat> let's give this a shot. So first we're going to chill the, uh, the, the, the cocktail glass, old-fashioned glass that the Sazerac goes in. Use these tongs. And while it's chilling, I also put a little herb saint in. I'm a, I'm a heavy uh, anise Sazerac guy, so... Just pour a little in, swirl it around, then let, let it chill over there to the side. And then in our mixing glass, we're gonna add the uh, simple syrup. I do about a quarter ounce, so I guess that's seven to eight mil. And then the uh, Peixo bitters. I don't do as much as Paul Gustings. If you ever go to New Orleans, you should definitely uh, visit Paul Gustings. Thankfully, he's back at Two Jacks Bar. But um, he'll do up to 13, I do six. How much, how much do you do? Not as much as I feel like. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well at the French 25 bar, we do six to seven. And then um, uh, a little herb saint as well. Just, I mean, just a splash in this. Because I do like uh, Lenisi. Then the two ounces of rye. which is, I guess, 60 mil. Right. We're gonna add ice and stir. sweet tongues. There we go. All right. Get it properly chilled, then we're going to dump the ice. Add a little more herb saint. This is the fun part. This is the rinsing of the glass. Kind of want to just spin it. And I always leave a little puddle because again, I like uh, I like the anise in the in the cocktail. All right, here we are. <clears throat> Another fun debate is the uh, the twist in. Obviously, you break the zest. But uh, twist in or out, I'm a twist in guy. I like the color contrast and uh, to keep smelling the lemon a lot more. But cheers. Sazerac cheers. cocktail. As to the uh, twist in <coughs> or out, you know, at the time that we were told not to put the twist in, we didn't have peelers the way we do today. And as everyone knows, the pith of the lemon is bitter. So the longer you would leave the peel in, the more bitter it would add to the drink. Today, with our vegetable peelers, we strip that pith 
off. So all we're really doing is expressing the oil and you're not adding that biliary element to the drink by including the twist into the drink. And it does add a visual element to the drink also without spoiling the flavor of it. But that's the reason why they said not to put the twist in is because it added a bitter component that was not pleasant. I like and the color contrast. Um, and uh, <clears throat> we all like bitter, so. It's a, it is a big debate. You should definitely go see Paul Gustings. He'll tell you why I make an incorrect Sazerac, and you can see his Sazerac, which I think is very special. It's uh, actually a homework assignment for my, uh, for my bartenders. You can't work at the French 75 unless you go see uh, Paul Gustings and have a Sazerac. You can add a bit of flair to your bartending. Uh, you know, when you add the Herb Saint to the glass, you throw it up in the air like that, as high as you feel like throwing it, um, and that the centrifugal force uh, coats the inside of the glass. When the Museum of the American Cocktail opened in January of 2005, I was set up to make uh, Sazeracs, and I made about 150 Sazeracs that night, and all night long I'm doing this. I ended up with a stripe of absinthe across the, the chest of my best suit. It took two dry cleanings to get it out. So in subsequent seminars, I often will buy one of those cheap ponchos that you can get on Bourbon Street for 99 cents, and I'll have that on so it doesn't, doesn't mess the up. The Gallagher my... of the cocktail world. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> But uh, it's not a bad thing to have a stripe of absinthe across your chest. Uh, so, um, All right, so face, face number two, the Sazerac evolved from that cognac drink that was served in the Cocotier. And this story also comes, uh, comes to us from Stanley Clisby Arthur, this idea that over the course of the 19th century, you had New Orleans as a French-speaking, a French city, French Creoles. They were all cognac drinkers At, after the Civil War. Uh, more and more Americans are coming to uh, New Orleans. You had the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, the Civil War in the 1860s. So it's becoming a more Americanized city, and Americans like their red liquor. They like their rye whiskey, their bourbon whiskey. So eventually, cognac was replaced by uh, rye whiskey, and at some point in the, in the let's say, 1870, you had the, the addition of absinthe or herb saint added to the drink, and the evolution was complete. So the Sazerac cocktail began as a, a cognac, a brandy-based drink, evolved into a rye whiskey drink, and today we know it as the rye whiskey drink that it is. Um, but if you, if you look at the third face, and that's that the, there was not a drink called the Sazerac cocktail around, until around 1900. Um, and, and the first time we ever see a drink called the Sazerac cocktail is in, in this book here, The World's Drinks and How to Mix Them, by William Cocktail Boothby. He was a San Francisco-based uh, bartender. Um, you first see it in 1899 in a newspaper story. Uh, a good deal was heard about two mysterious articles, a Sazerac cocktail and an imperial gin fizz. And we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, but it's our belief that the, the, the drink was invented at the Sazerac house by Billy Wilkinson, and he and Vincent Mireille perfected this drink, but we're talking around 1900, thereabouts, 1890s. Uh, and you see the two recipes that are found in that Boothby book. One of them, uh, one of them is made with, uh, with, with uh, uh, Sazerac brandy, but you also, and that's the way they served it at La Armand Renier, and then you also have the rye whiskey-based drink. So you see both recipes in this book. Um, using Peixos or Peixos and Angostura bitters. And a lot of people will put both Peixos and, or, and Angostura bitters in the drink. I just use Peixos myself. I think you both are both also exclusive uh, to, to Peixos bitters. So, um, and you see I other... I use Peixos and Angostura. You use both, okay. Um, I, use, I use Peixos. So you see, you see different variations on the Sazerac in the, in the early part of the, of the 20th century. Uh, this has the two types of, uh, of bitters, but, but rye whiskey... Um, this is a 1911 recipe where, where it talks about adding a, a bit of French vermouth, dry vermouth to uh, the Sazerac. Um, you also see that in a German language um, uh, book in 1913 where you have a little bit of, um, of uh, vermouth added. And in some of the early recipes we see maraschino liqueur, and we'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, if you want to watch this, get a get a screenshot of this link. This is a really nice documentary. It's only 22 minutes long. It just came out um, a few weeks ago. Um, you have David Wondrich, Robert Simonson, uh, Paul Clark. Um, there's Paul Clark there. Ted Bro, absinthe expert and producer. I don't know who he is. Chris McMillan, Chris Hanna, uh, <laughs> Wondrich, and, and Simonson, and several other experts in the in the craft talking about the history and evolution of the Sazerac. 
And when they were making the film, um, they asked me, okay, you're a descendant of his or an ancestor. He's one of your ancestors. Do you have an image of him? Do you have an old photograph of him? Well, I have a photograph of, my, of his contemporary, my great-great-great-grandfather. Unfortunately, I didn't have a photograph of Antoine Peychaud. So they came up with this uh, image of what they believe he looked like. And I, I guess we do have the same nose. I, I don't know. But uh, uh, it's nice to know what my ancestor looked like, according to this cartoon. All right, we're going to briefly talk about, we're not going to talk about the hand grain, but we're going to talk about that other very, very, very popular drink in New Orleans uh, that you can get when you go down there. How many of you have been to New Orleans? All right, very good. The hurricane, it's kind of a must-see. A must uh, go to Pat O'Brien's, sit around the flaming fountain, get a, get a hurricane cocktail. It's not a particularly good cocktail, but the experience is, is fun. Um, the hurricane has its, its origins uh, at Pat O'Brien's, uh, perhaps. Th this is the original location. It's called the La Branche building at the corner of St. Peter and Royal. It's no longer there. It's moved a block and a half up. Toward the building's still there. The building's still there, but it's no longer housed. I worked there. But. At, um, Pat O'Brien's is no longer in this building. But um, New Orleans has a notorious history during Prohibition. A lot of their finest restaurants and bars simply refuse to, to quit serving. Pat O'Brien's was known as Pat o Mr. O'Brien's Club Tipperary. You had to have a password, according to folklore, of storms of Bruin to get in. Uh, Arnaud's uh, had an unmarked doorway on Bienville Street. The door is still there. Chris, do you believe in the... You had to have a special key to get into the speakeasy mm, no, on the, Bienville. The Richelieu Bar wasn't built until 1949, after Arnaud's death, uh, 1951. So uh, that's when that bar was created. It was created by Germaine Wells uh, after her father's death. She had gone to France for a year, uh, came back, wanted to recreate the dress-up nights at Maxime's, and built that bar um, with much chagrin to her wife. However, Arnaud was arrested for uh, 19 counts yeah. of violation of the Volstead Act, and, you know, uh, legend has it that he, you know, appeared in front of his jury of his peers and explained that you couldn't have dining without drink and that in New Orleans uh, they found him not guilty. Uh, <laughs> what's more likely is that prohibition was repealed uh, before the prosecution came to fruition and the case became moot. I, I've not been able to find uh, court records uh -oh. of the actual trial itself, but uh, there's no f doubting the fact that he was charged with violation of Volstead uh, on multiple counts. So you're bringing American PC, and, and uh, we, have to, we have to get our power going here. Um, either that or we have 10% of, of our time left, right? Um, talk a little bit about, on the slide it talks about the old absinthe house closed, but they kept reopening and kept reopening, and they en ended up, the, the federal marshals came in and confiscated the actual bar. And so you had, for a while, you had two old absinthe houses in New Orleans, uh, you had the absinthe house at the corner of what, Conti? Well, what happens is or, they, uh, passed, Bienville. they passed what they call the padlock law, that if you owned a building and you rented it to somebody and they ran an illegal bar, if they came in and arrested them, you would just rent it to somebody else. And so the federal government, in order to discover that, issued a law called the padlock law that if your place was found violating the law, they put a lock on the door for one year. And you could not enter or leave, remove any of the fixtures, uh, and that way, if you owned the building, there was no incentive for you to uh, rent it uh, to somebody who was an illegal operator. So this happened to the abs old Absinthe House bar in the 1920s. And the previous owner, when the year was up, up, took all of the contents and opened a bar on the next corner, which was also a speakeasy. And so for the next 75 years, you had this ongoing dispute about which one is the real old Absinthe House. Well, in fact, the one that exists today at the corner of Iberville and uh, Bourbon Street was the old Absinthe House. The one at the corner of Conti and Bourbon was the old Absinthe House bar. The because, physical bar. Because it did have the physical bar and the fixtures located there. And in the 1990s, a guy bought it, gutted it. If you ever see a picture of a bar in New Orleans, invariably it would be the old Absinthe House bar. It was one of the just most spectacular places. Is it on the label of the herb sink? In, in the uh, most spectacular places in the city. No, that's the old yeah. Absinthe House. Right, yeah. Uh, but not the old yeah. Absinthe House bar. But right. the, pi the pictures you see are always the old Absinthe House bar. And a guy gutted it and turned it into a daiquiri shop, which it is to this day. But now the original bar has been restored, the fixtures. But if you walk in, it's not the square bar with the football helmets hanging around it that you see. You actually have to walk to the back wall, and there's a door on the right, and it 
leads to another dining room. And there is the original 19th century Cypress Bar, I believe one of the only two antebellum bars in New Orleans, uh, with the original absinthe drippers uh, on them, uh, as uh, you can see pictures of on the Library of Congress from the turn of the, uh, from the, turn of the century. And uh, really one of the least known, uh, most beautiful parts of the story of New Orleans drink is, is that bar. Oh, Henry drank at that bar. Mark Twain uh, drank at that drank at that bar, one of the most historic bars in all of the world uh, that nobody ever sees. Uh. All right, let me talk quickly about uh, a couple of celebrated prohibition agents uh, often having to make trips to New Orleans to, to shut down the various bars and restaurants that were flaunting the prohibition law. Izzy Einstein and Moe Smith uh, traveled the country shutting places down. They often would uh, dress up in disguises, uh, posing as a butcher, a dry agent, uh, arrest employees in a drugstore. Uh, at various times, they would dress up in drag or put on crazy beards. Um, but they would go from city to city across the United States, keeping track of how long it took for them to find illegal booze. Um, during his travels, Izzy kept track of how long it would take. In Pittsburgh, where he disguised himself as a Polish mill worker, it was 11 minutes. In Atlanta, 17 minutes. Chicago and St. Louis tied at 21 minutes. In Cleveland, Izzy had to wait 29 minutes before a vaudeville theater usher could leave long enough to steer him to a speakeasy. Washington, D.C., my hometown, required the longest search, one hour. Izzy finally got an address from a police officer. But in New Orleans, it set the speed record. Between the station and the hotel, he asked the taxi driver where he could slake his thirst. The taxi driver offered to sell him a pint then and there. Elapsed time, 35 seconds. All right, so was the hurricane invented at Pat O'Brien's? Uh, according to the website, it was invented during World War II because you had a shortage of whiskey, but you had plenty of rum. The, the war wasn't happening in the Caribbean, so in order for uh, New Orleans bar and restaurant owners to buy whiskey, they had to agree to buy for every one case of, of whiskey, so the story went, they had to buy eight or 10 cases or more of rum. So they had a surplus of rum and being you know, ingenious uh, Americans. They, they figured out a way to get rid of this rum. They invented this fruit and rum-based cocktail called the Hurricane. So they're, they're pinning it to 19, the 1940s, because, of course, World War II uh, began in 1939, but the U.S. didn't enter the war until 1941. So sometime around 42, 43, 44 is when Pat O'Brien says the Hurricane was invented. I happen to find this 1941 recipe guide from Ron Rico, and within it, you see a hurricane punch, one ounce of lime juice, one ounce of lemon juice, two ounces of passion fruit syrup, four ounces of a Rico red label. So I have a recipe that dates back to 1941, which may or may not debunk um, the Pat O'Brien story. So how do you make an authentic hurricane cocktail from Pat O'Brien's? You have to have either the bottled or the powdered mix. Uh, that's craft bartending at its finest. Uh, if you can get the... It, it's sort of the space age. You know, I grew up drinking Tang, you know, that powdered orange juice uh, that, that was famous for the space flights. Um, you can do better than that. Use some fresh lime juice, fresh lemon juice. This is actually a nice drink. If you go easy on the passion fruit syrup, that's where you're getting most of your sweetness. This is actually a pretty, pretty good drink. All right, now we're moving on to the second drink that you were just served. This is the Raffignac cocktail. There's the aforementioned Paul Gustings of uh, Broussard's. Um, serving a Raffignac cocktail. Two, two Jacks. Two he's jacks. gone, returned to Two Jacks. Oh, he's, has he? Excellent. He's going back, yeah, it's awesome. So who is this Raffignac character? He was the mayor of New Orleans during the 1820s um, uh, from French uh, nobility, uh, merchant, uh, wealthy Louisian merchant, banker, member of the state legislature, the 10th mayor of New Orleans from 1820 to 1828, uh, written up in the, the Kansas City Star. Um, the, the drink... You first start seeing it after the Civil War, the Raffignac cocktail. Um, this, is, this is a story I found from the 1914 um, Donaldsonville, Donaldsonville, I, I better put these away, um, chief from, uh, from Louisiana. You can see that big black spot on the paper that cuts right into where I was reading about the, uh, the Raffignac, unfortunately. But uh, now, it, um, they said that... Mayor Raffignac had a, a very large nose. It was framed in one of nature's most prodigal moods, and it was simply enormous. It was a wonderful nose, for when na nature left off, art took it up and complicated it. So the, the, the political cartoonist, the characters of the day, had a lot of fun with his nose. I don't see it in this portrait, but uh, apparently he had a big nose. But he was quite, a, quite an excellent mayor, um, introduced um, a, a lot of... Uh, 
public works, uh, uh, tried to regulate gambling, which has always been a problem in New Orleans. Um, and the circumstances of his death were a bit unfortunate and, and suspicious. He was, he was admiring or cleaning a gun, and then he uh, had a stroke, fell over, the gun went off and finished him off. So that's, that's uh, how he died, apparently. But uh, there is a street name for him in the Ninth Ward, the Lower Ninth Ward of New Orleans, called Ruffinyak Street. Chris Hanna took these photos. It's a bit desolate now. Uh, the area was underwater for quite a while during, during uh, Hurricane Katrina and a lot of the houses are no longer there. Um, but there are a couple of ways, just like there are a couple of ways to make the Sazerac cocktail, you can use either cognac or, or rye whiskey or both. That's the great thing about these products is they, they sort of play well together. Um, in New Orleans, famous New Orleans drinks and how to mix them, he, um, he recommends using whiskey, typically rye whiskey, a little bit of, uh, of raspberry syrup and seltzer. Um, a couple of recipes here uh, also adds Dubonnet, uh, to, to the mix, um, and bourbon whiskey, and uh, a little bit of orange. Chris, why don't you talk about how you make it at the, at the French 75 bar? Uh, we, use, uh, we use a split base um, at the French 75 with cognac and rye, and that's because of uh, the, do you have the picture of that slide, of the Maley's? Well, I, after, uh, after the hurricane, I came back in 2006, and I was at the, the first uh, presentation Phil Green and Chris McMillan did at the Pharmacy Museum when the American Cocktail Museum opened. And then I realized there was a lot of history and that we had this um, New Orleans historic collection. And uh, this particular exhibit had uh, they advertised a lot of old menus from um, a lot of the restaurants that no longer exist. Maley's was one of them. And at the time uh, when I was reading about the Raff and Yak, Maley's invented it, but really it's just, it was just their, um, their house cocktail. So when I found their menu, I saw that they, uh, they had cognac and rye, and I was like, oh, that was, that's pretty sweet, you know, and uh, so I used, so we, we moved from rye to cognac and rye, and then, then we, kept, we kept reading, and then this is um, going to be better described by Macmillan here, that uh, the red hembreg, which was like a, a vinegar raspberry syrup um, in the, to make, the, uh, to make the, the cocktail have like a little bit of a, like more of an edge instead of just straight raspberry syrup. And I think it has a nice ting to it, you know. You know, some recipes are just raspberry syrup and a lemon peel. You at least need the acid. So I thought that the, um, the red hembreg, which is a German word for, which is pretty much shrub, so raspberry shrub made for a better cocktail. So that's how we, this is how we uh, make the cocktail at, uh, at the French 75 bar. But you do not believe in the, the vinegar. Well, no, I think this drink is an enigma. You know, we don't really have any absolute definitions of what the drink was. And yet, it was one of the city's most celebrated drinks. And as a bartender, we're always looking for new things to please our guest with. I mean, that, that, that's the whole point of this stuff, you know, is to please the people in front of us. And so we have a drink associated with the city, celebrated for generations, completely lost to us today, and we really don't know how it was made. You know, uh, it's Glisby Arthur, who all of this stuff comes with. Uh, Phil's going to talk about him in a, in a minute. You know, uh, he... We owe so much to him because few people really realized and recognized the contribution of American drink to global culinary culture at the time in the immediate post-prohibition period. And so he and guys like H.L. Mink and only a very few actually wrote about this time that had passed. Generally, this drink appears, starts appearing in the 1870s, 1880s, at the same time the highball appears. Uh, the Tom Collins, uh, the brandy soda, uh, this is when carbonated drinks modified with carbonated beverages uh, start to become popular. Uh, I think there's a very good case uh, to be made. Uh, we see historic products. Uh, Chris is absolutely right. When you make the drink with raspberry syrup, uh, it's just raspberry syrup and club soda. With it, it, it's not compelling. It's not balanced. Uh, there, and that's for me. When I look at these drinks, this is always the thing I'm looking for: is what made this drink famous. Why, why are we talking about this drink today? Uh, what is it? And when I can't drink the drink and figure that out, I always assume that I'm missing something. And so. You know, I came across a reference from the 1880s talking about Rofignac syrup. And then uh, Simonson uh, recently wrote a book, you know, where he claims to have unraveled the mystery of Hemberg, which does not exist. There's no such product that we can find uh, that Clisby Arthur cites called Hemberg. But there's Hemburgist, 
you know, which is a raspberry eau de vie. Uh, but I think there's a, there, there's a good case to be made that there were acidified syrups uh, available. And I think Chris is, is absolutely on the right track uh, with this. It's certainly, uh, if not historically confirmable, you know, it makes a much more delicious and compelling drink uh, to have the drink with a, a slight acidification uh, to balance the sweetness, uh, to balance the sweetness of it. I still haven't tasted a Rofignac yet that I said, oh, this is, belongs in the canon of great drinks. This, one, this one's pretty good. But <laughs> this actually is pretty, this actually is pretty decent. Uh, but this is, this, is, this, boys, this, this, is, this is a drink for people who are interested in, like us, in exploring these things that we need to look at. Uh, and, and all of us need to, you know, look and delve deeper into to see that if we really can unravel uh, this drink, because, you know, things that transcend generational fashion, things come and go. But when every generation likes and appreciates something, that means that there's some intrinsic quality to it, you know, that everybody recognizes and enjoys. And we've lost, as of this moment, uh, whatever that secret was with this particular, with this particular drink. All right, so the, uh, the third drink that you're going to be enjoying very soon is the, the Vucare. How many of you have had a Vucare? Okay, this is, this is a great drink, and it's, it's, getting, it's finally getting the, the recognition it deserves in the last 10 years or so. Um, this, this is how it's written up in famous New Orleans drinks and how to mix them. This is the cocktail that Walter Bergeron, head bartender of the Hotel Monteleone Cocktail Lounge, takes special pride in mixing. He originated it, he says, to do honor to the famed Vucare, that part of New Orleans where the antique shops and the iron lace balconies give sightseers a glimpse into the romance of another day. So this is a, a cocktail menu from the Monteleone Hotel of circa 1834, 35. 1930. I'm sorry, 1934, 35. Prohibition ended in December of 33. Uh, and you see that for the price of 30 cents, you can get yourself uh, a Monteleone. So they were very proud of it. It gets uh, a Monteleone cocktail. The Vucare was, was 40 cents. Just underneath that. What do you think was in the Mondelion? We never dug no, we into don't, that. We don't know. Yeah. That's right. You know, there are a few drinks that we can actually attribute to a person. You know, that we say, this person invented this drink. And it seems very clear that Walter Bergeron did, in fact, invent this drink. Uh, historical census records, uh, he did work at the Montleon Hotel. Cheryl Charming, which some of you may know, Miss Charming, the most published author in all of the cocktail world, uh, now in New Orleans at the Bourbon O Bar, actually went out and found Walter Bergeron's son. Uh, who recently died and talked to him. Bergeron also worked at the Sazerac uh, bar, so he was a veteran of many of the uh, great bars of the city. And he was also arrested during uh, Whitaker's ride. You know, every uh, week in New Orleans during Prohibition, the chief of police would go out and uh, ceremoniously walk into one of the city's most prominent bars that was uh, not before pro was before Prohibition, not during Prohibition, and arrest the bar and close it down for violating the Sunday closing laws. Uh, which were widely and flagrantly violated there. But you kind of got the impression, based on the bars that they did, that they would actually call up the bar and say, look, we're coming by to, you know, bust you this week. But he was, you know. he was arrested for selling, um, uh, they had these ticket books. Uh, it was gambling. He worked at a cigar store during Prohibition in the 1920s, and he was arrested for that, for selling these, these ticket books, you know, numbers racket type of thing. Um, I wrote an article in the Daily Beast about uh, the Vucre. If you Google Daily Beast, Phil Green, Philip Green, you'll, you, there's a story that you can read further about Walter Bergeron. He died during Mardi Gras, of, I think, 1947, uh, February of 1947. Yeah, I think he was at the grocery store. He had a heart attack. Yeah, he was at a grocery <laughs> store. Uh, but uh, uh, the Vucre, uh, it's, it's made at the, uh, at the Hotel Monteleon, uh, right on Royal Street, the first block of Royal. Uh, second block of Royal Street from Canal, um, and as as I was saying, it's it he he made it to do honor to the famed Vucare, and it, and I I've always interpreted this to mean that it's sort of a reflection of the people of the Vucare, the French Quarter, the Old Square, uh, circa you know 1930, uh, because New Orleans, uh, the French Quarter at this time had a lot of different. You know, populations. Some towns have Little Italy. Some towns have uh, Chinatowns. New Orleans had a lot of French Creole uh, holdovers from the old French regime. It had a lot of Italian immigrants living there. It had a lot of Americans there. So what you have in a in a, um, a Vucare 
you have uh, rye whiskey representing the American people in the, in the quarter. You have sweet vermouth uh, representing the Italians. Uh, a lot of them were Sicilians, but you had a lot of Italians living in the French quarter. Uh, we're using Cognac Ferrand 1840 and Benedictine in the drink. Uh, that represents the French people. You also had a lot of Caribbean influence, a lot of people from, from uh, the islands, Angostura bitters. Of course, Peixot's bitters is, is a French by way of, of uh, the Caribbean. So I've, I've always seen this as sort of a reflection of the demographics of, of the, of the Vucre, and I, I think it's sort of history in a glass. It's, it's, it's a great, great drink. And we can talk for a minute about uh, what Chris and I t refer to as the, the Crescent City cocktail trinity. Within 100 yards in, in, in either direction of the corner of Royal and Iberville or Iberville streets, you have behind you, if you're facing towards St. Louis, uh, Jackson Square, behind you is where the Sazerac bar used to be, that's where the Sazerac was invented. Right in front of you have the Hotel Monteleone, that's where the Vucre comes from. If you make a left and, and head away from the river toward Bourbon Street, you have the La Louisiane uh, restaurant, which is no longer there. But you have these three drinks that share something in common. You know, the rye whiskey, you add vermouth and you have the La Louisiane, you add vermouth and, and uh, uh, cognac and you have the uh, the, the Vucre. This is a, a photo of the old La Louisiane that's looking toward the river on Iberville Street. Um, great old restaurant, unfortunately no longer there. Kind of incidentally, you know, what the Brennans are to the 20th century, New Orleans cocktail culture, uh, the alcators of uh, Antoine's fame were to the 19th century. Antoine had three sons. Uh, one went on to run Antoine's, uh, the other uh, ran La Louisiane. And the third uh, ran La Chine de Rotisserie, which is now Ralph's on the, uh, oh, okay. Ralph's on the park. Uh, yeah, cool. I, I have a slightly different filter as a bartender that I look at these three drinks through. Uh, I describe them as the three classic New Orleans whiskey cocktails. You know, the Sazerac was such a famed cocktail at the beginning of the 20th century that everybody was required to serve one. But Sazerac was a proprietary name. Uh, Sazerac sold bottled cocktails. And in their advertisements, uh, they said, if you want to drink a genuine Sazerac cocktail, you must purchase the Sazerac bottled cocktail. And those bars that didn't want to sell the proprietary brand of their competitor, you know, each had to sell something that was similar, uh, but somewhat different. And so if you look at all three of these drinks, uh, the Sazerac, the La Louisiane, and the Bucure, they all share commonalities. Uh, and I think they're all variations on the theme, each one representing uh, the specialty drinks of the place that they were associated with, although the Bucure uh, is post-prohibition, uh, where the other two are pre-prohibition. Uh, pre all right, uh, briefly, yeah, 1924, he, he was the manager, Walter Bergeron, manager of the United Cigar Store, arrested for possession of punch boards. Uh, he comes back to the Monteleon after, after Prohibition ends. In the 1940s, he worked at the old Sazerac Bar, uh, died on February 13th, 1947, just a, f a few days before Mardi Gras Day. Um, now, a lot of people mistakenly believe that the, the Vucure was invented at the Carousel Lounge. How many of you have been to the Carousel Lounge, the great bar at the Monteleon? Uh, it opened on Monday, September 3rd, 1949, at 9 o'clock in the morning. Again, how many people open a bar on Monday morning at 9 o'clock? In New Orleans, not a big deal, right? But uh, this is an old postcard showing what we believe to be the original configuration of the, uh, the rotating carousel bar. Um, it evolved with the, you know, the change of decor of the 1960s and 1970s. This is what it looked like in the 1960s. Um, and of course, the, the, the floor, this part of the bar, the, from here in, it rotates. And it takes, I think, 15 minutes for the bar to make a complete revolution. And it's kind of off-putting when you're standing in that red area and you're trying to have a conversation with the person lucky enough to be sitting on a bar stool. You have to walk a couple of steps. And, you know, it, it, I, I guess it would be good if you're a young lady trying to get rid of the guy who's trying to hit on you. You know, <laughs> if, if it's too deep around the bar, you can lose the straggler. The fun part is you have to climb over the bar to get in. Yeah, there's no have, hatch. And, or... and you have to climb over the bar to get out. So yeah. how you go to the washroom, uh, I still don't know what the bartenders do when they go, <laughs> when they go there. <laughs> so this is uh, the 1970s. You can see they're, they're, they're getting in the theme of, uh, I put Austin Powers in there, but... Uh, you know, that, that garish motif of the 1970s. Uh, this is more or less what it looks like today. Um, and 
There's Chris Hanna enjoying a, a, a vucare, I take Cheers. it. Is that a vucare? That is, yeah, of course. And um, after a few vucares, things get a little blurry. <laughs> but uh, I don't think the, the camera was, the bar was revolving that quickly. But uh, Only in your mind. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful effect there. All right, we're going to talk a little bit about the Ramos Gin Fizz. Uh, in seminars past, we've actually demonstrated the Ramos Gin Fizz. This, this is a drink that takes quite a bit of doing to make. Um, these, these are some old ephemera that I, that I purchased on eBay, an old coaster, an old menu. Um, but this drink requires several minutes of shaking if you're going to make it correctly. And I'll, talk, I'll let Chris McMillan and Chris Hanna talk about the actual making of it. But in seminars past, we will hand out a, a, a shaker to everybody in the crowd. We'll play... Uh, um, uh, shake it up, baby. Shake it up, baby. No, uh, twist and shout. <laughs> twist. Uh, shake it up, baby. Twist and shout. No, but we've also played Elvis. <laughs> all shook up. That's it. We play Elvis Presley's All Shook Up. And we asked that everybody in the crowd shake the drink for the duration of the song. Unfortunately, we didn't have a gin sponsor today, so we can only tell you about it. But um, um, this is a photo of, of the, the famous... Uh, um, this is the this, this is, is the stag. This is the stag. Um, Henry Ramos came from Baton Rouge, was it? Well, he lived in New Orleans. His family came from Indiana, and he went from New Orleans as a young man to Baton Rouge and opened a bar there and became successful. And once he achieved success there, he came back home to New Orleans and opened a bar here. His brother then followed him from Baton Rouge here, and and he was uh, on Gravier Street from. Uh, the early 1880s up until 1919 when so prohibition was The enacted. imperial cabinet and then the stag. And then the stag. Okay. So he, you see the, the gin fizzes of, of Ramos starting to become popular at this time. He died during prohibition. He was one of the few saloon keepers who abided by the law. He, he worked feverishly up until the last day of uh, legalized sale of, of, of alcohol, and then he closed up shop. And the, the recipe, it, you know, we, there was concern that it had died along with him, but uh, uh, it, it has been unearthed. But here you see an old book from the 1940s that I have in my collection. Thank you. Um, where it talks about how to make a Ramos Gin Fizz, and it gives you the ingredients, uh, orange flower water, lemon juice, lime juice, powdered sugar, egg white, uh, crushed ice, uh, rich cream, seltzer water, and gin. And I like how it says, mix in this order, crushed ice, fruit juices, cream, blah, blah, blah. Add beaten egg and shake until tired, shake again. You know, <laughs> shake until you're tired and then shake some more. So, uh, and Huey Long, the great uh, uh, Louisiana governor and U.S. senator, the kingfish of Louisiana, actually went to New York City uh, to do some business in the 19, 1935, July of 1935, and had been on the wagon for a while, hadn't, hadn't had anything to drink, but he decided in New York City to have a Ramos Gin Fizz, but he couldn't find a bartender who knew, knew how to make it. So he um, called down to New Orleans and had the bartender at the Roosevelt Hotel, which specialized in making the Ramos Gin Fizz, Sam Gorino, got on a plane, came up to New York City, and uh, they did a photo op. Uh, we have newsreel footage of him showing the bartender at the New Yorker Hotel how to make the Ramos Gin Fizz. Got a lot of publicity for this, um, and it, it sort of put the drink on the map in New York City. Uh, and it's funny because he had to sample six of them until he decided, yes, I think you're making it correctly now. Uh, every, every newspaper in the country covered that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and you can still stay at the New Yorker. In fact, I stayed there about a month ago. Um, it's still there. It's, it's a, little, a little rough around the edges, uh, but uh, it's a great old hotel, and you can stay there for about 100 bucks a night. And it's right across the street from the Pen Pennsylvania Station. Uh, so it's very convenient if you're taking Amtrak or something like that. But uh, the Ramos Gin Fizz, uh, just a great drink to make. Um, now, do you all ever use them? Uh, use a blender when you make it, or I was taught. You know, for, I was for brunches? when I worked at Arnold's, you know, and I worked there in the Richelieu Bar. We're both <laughs> Han, uh, Hannah and I uh, cut our teeth at very different times. Uh, there was an older bartender there. His name was Bill Gillespie. He was in his 80s. Uh, he had worked at the Roosevelt Bar uh, in the 1950s. And, of course, we had an endless argument that, you know, he said that soda was not a component of the Ramos Gin Fizz. Uh, and I explained to him that fizz, by definition, means <laughs> that it had soda water. <laughs> but we were taught to use a technique that was uh, called flash blending, where you would mix the drink, pour it into a blender, take a handful of crushed ice, and go whoop, 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 and, and froth the drink, and froth the drink up. 
you know, for me, uh, to use uh, uh, my term, this is uh, my white whale. You know, for me, when I started drinking Ramus Gin Fizzes, it, again, it was the same story. This is the most famous drink, to my mind, even more than the Sazerac, uh, that New Orleans ever created. And all the canon of classic American drink, the only drink whose name is preceded by the person who invented it, is the Ramus Gin Fizz. We have no other classic cocktail that we identify the creator of the drink uh, associated with the drink, uh, with the drink itself. And it's a Rothenjak, but we don't know that he... It was named for him. The, the mystery of the drink uh, for me that I've wrestled with uh, for these last years is when you go online and see vintage Ramus Gin Fizz glasses as sold at the Roosevelt Hotel, they're glasses about this height, yeah. but a little bit narrower. It's, it's actually a style of glass called a seltzer glass. And how do you fit everything that we put into a glass that big into a glass this big? Obviously, there's some disconnect between the way the drink was made and the way the drink is made. Today we judge the ramus by how high you can make the meringue uh, extend above the glass. And, you know, the bartenders are very proud of the fact that they can, you know, have a stiff meringue. Well, to achieve that, all you have to do is take whipped cream and shake it up. Uh, you know, it really has nothing to do with artistry or expertise or technique. It's just the simple physics of shaking cream. And what is the compelling quality of this drink? What made it the most famous drink? We're told by Clisby Arthur that, you know, Mardi Gras 1915, they had 32 shaker boys who couldn't keep up with the demand for this drink. They would send office boys by uh, from the offices during Mardi Gras to bring trays of the drink back to the offices. They had eight, I have a journal from 1898 from a, where a wholesale liquor salesman came to New Orleans uh, representing Plymouth Gin and Perrier Jouet. He had eight bartenders on duty who did nothing but manufacture this drink all day long. But... So is it about how much club soda you can put into the drink or is it about how the drink tasted? And, and for me, that's always what I'm looking for is what does the drink taste like? So I started going through all my old recipe books, uh, my oldest uh, Ramus recipe. And you can, if you're all familiar with the EUVS website, if you are not familiar with it, write this down, E-U-V-S, and just put it into Google. Uh, Perno Ricard uh, and the Perno family on the Isle of Bendor have created an online digital cocktail library that encompasses hundreds of historic cocktail works from the, uh, going back to the 18th century. Uh, it's the most incredible resource uh, for bartenders uh, as an archival resource available in the, uh, available in the world today. It's e EUVS hyphen vintage hyphen cocktail hyphen books. Yeah, just put EUVS into Google and hit the link. And, it, <laughs> and, it, and it'll, take you right, it'll take you right there. But sure enough, it's amazing. It, it, it only calls for a half ounce of milk. Also, Ramus gives an interview in the 1920s, which we sometimes used in this seminar, where he actually discusses the drink during Prohibition. And there were a couple of differences in the way that he made the drink and describes the drink being made in the way we make it today. Uh, the first was he didn't use heavy cream. You know, uh, he used what he called sweet milk, which was whole milk, unhomogenized milk. And so it wouldn't have been uh, as heavy or thick as the heavy cream-based drink we make today, but it would have certainly been richer than what we call whole milk today because we've had the butter, uh, the cream, everything incorporated uh, uh, within the drink itself. And the other thing is he says that you put the club soda, the mineral water, into the mixing glass and you shake the drink until all the bubbles are gone. Now, these are Ramus' explicit instructions. So he's not putting it there for effervescence and volume in the way that we use it today, but he's using it for quality, and he uses this word uh, to describe it, pungency. Uh, and, you know, when you drink a Pellegrino or a Perrier, that kind of flinty, metallic, you know, bite that you get with a good mineral water uh, is that balancing component uh, that he's trying to add to the uh, trying to add to the drink. So I'm now serving the drink in a glass smaller than this. About the same height, but a little bit smaller in diameter. And I tell you, it's brilliant because you can taste the gin. You know, for me, uh, fundamental to any cocktail is that the base cocktail, be the, the base ingredient be the star. Old Tom and, and, or... Yeah, Old Tom. Uh, in not, fact, so uh, in, in the journal that my salesman, you know, who's selling Plymouth, you know, is, uh, uh, Ramus says he loves the mixing qualities of Plymouth, but the price is so high and that he uses Burnett's Old Tom, uh, you know, was the gin that he used uh, to make the Ramus, uh, uh, to make the Ramus with. 
And so, uh, like I said, for me, it's fundamental that the base ingredient be the star. You drink whiskey because you like whiskey. You drink gin because you like gin. And when you make the Ramus like this, everything is the same except for the gin, except for the club soda and the milk. You put a half ounce of milk, which would be about, what, uh, 15 mils. Uh, you put a half ounce in? Half, half ounce oh. of milk and oh, a half wow. ounce of club soda. How do you get it to fit in there? You can't put more than that in there no, right. and get it to fit into the glass that it was historically served in. So if we know that the gin was the same, because the recipes tell us the quantity of the gin was the same, we know that the citrus was the same, because the recipes tell us that the citrus was the same, and we know that the sweetener was the same, because the recipes historically tell us so. The only other two variables are the dairy and the mineral, and the mineral water, and the recipes actually hold that up when you go back and look at historic recipes in the pre-prohibition era uh, that were contemporaneous to the time. And, and try it. It, it. It's absolutely beautiful. Uh, I've gotten to the point where I've seen bartenders now, if the meringue's not high enough, they get a bottle of club soda and they just keep pouring it into the drink uh, to make it cup up. And it's all about the visual aesthetic as opposed to being the drink itself and what it tastes like. And this was the drink that hundreds of people stood in line, uh, that they had had eight bartenders on duty at all times to make. The, the kids would shake until their arms were tired, and then they'd throw the shaker over their shoulders, and the next kid would catch it and keep shaking, according to Lots of various stories you about take that. Over. All right. I'm so. seating control of the clicker now, <laughs> folks. You're on your own. <laughs> so, you know, for me, uh, Phil's an attorney who came to law school in uh, New Orleans, uh, uh, discovered that he was related to Antoine Pacheco. That's why I tell people. Uh, uh, took him down the path of the interest of this and uh, was invited to the first tales, uh, second tales, huh? It's, second tales, 2004. Uh, which is where we, uh, is, which is where we met, you know, and uh, like that's the incredible thing about tales of the cocktail. Perhaps this is more industry centric here, but those of you who have been to New Orleans know that this is not an industry event. This is a cultural event. It's where people both within the industry and without the industry who share this common interest uh, come to be together and to celebrate the things that we all love uh, and are fascinated about it. And it's so diverse because there are so many different components of it. So for me, why New Orleans? You know, what, what's important about New Orleans? It's very clear that everything we do comes from the English. You know, I mean, the foundations of the cocktail world are a deconstruction of punch. You know, grog to or toddy, sling, uh, uh, bittered sling, or sour. All, every drink we make is a variation of one of these four forms. Uh, Wayne Collins uh, gives a wonderful, uh, used to give a wonderful uh, seminar called The Three Amigos, uh, discussing this basic concept that every drink is, is a variation. So when the Americans came to New Orleans, uh, what did they find there uh, that contributed to American drink uh, as it exist uh, today. Well, I came across the, you know, uh, I got a bunch of uh, material about colonial era New Orleans. And, you know, one of the first things when we call it the French Quarter, but it was built by the Spanish. You know, the uh, French were very inept colonial administrators. The Spanish were very expert uh, colonial uh, administrators. And the first thing uh, they were, when the Spanish, when the Spanish first came, uh, uh, the governor was sent back uh, by the French. And so uh, they sent an uh, Irishman uh, named uh, Alejandro O'Reilly uh, to uh, take command of the city. And the first thing he did was uh, hang all of the insurgents uh, who had uh, sent the governor back. But the next thing he did is uh, issues laws regulating taverns. And uh, in the licenses that were issued, there's a, a curious entry uh, in that he issued a license for a lemonade seller. Uh, master lemonade seller, and you know this really intrigued me. What was this master lemonade seller? Well, it turns out that in you know 17th century France, uh, as uh, global trade starts to emerge, uh, coffee, uh, tea, uh, chocolate, uh, and distilled spirits all come into widespread consumption uh, during this latter uh, 17th century uh, era. And uh, Louis was uh, king of France, and uh, in order to uh, raise money to, for his building projects, think Versailles, uh, and to finance his wars, uh, he had to raise money. And the franchises to uh, sell 
uh, goods were uh, awarded uh, through the crown, purchased from the crown in the form of uh, guild ownerships. And uh, in the 1670s, a guild was uh, created called the Guild of Last Master Lemonadiers, uh, which comes out of an Italian uh, uh, expertise. Uh, I'm not going to get too far into this, but I want to really want to introduce this subject to you guys because uh, I, I, people need to start looking at this. You know, we've spent years, decades now, pouring through uh, ancient cocktail guides, and yet because. Uh, coffee was seen as medicinal and new, and distilled spirits were new, and distilling spirits was new. Uh, the guild to retail these things were all awarded under the umbrella of this guild of master lemonadiers. And the retail establishments, the coffee houses, uh, the term we used in New Orleans, uh, were in French called cafes. But the primary retail product in the cafe was distilled spirits. And this expertise included, uh, I don't know if you can read this, but it covers emulsions, infusions, oils, uh, confitures, glaces, uh, frozen iced beverages, uh, everything that we aspire to be. You know, when we look at this idea of being masters of the ability to capture, preserve, uh, and present flavors to people for recreation, uh, uh, this expertise existed in France in the 18th century uh, in, in the form of this Guild of La Master Lemonadiers. And to demonstrate this, this is 1804. These are six different kinds, seven different kinds of juleps in 1804. And the George julep, you know, was medicinal in character, but you can see they have a julep for gout, uh, they have a julep for, cat, for uh, colic, and I do not speak French, so you'll have to forgive me, but up on the top left, you'll see it says, a julep refresh us, mom, whatever the fuck that means, <laughs> excuse me, uh, but that means for refreshment, you know, that people were drinking juleps for pleasure, and the French had expertise and were teaching people how to make them in 1804. And I, I want to just go back real quick. Because it says here, uh, I know a little bit of French. It looks to me, it says, it effervesce, effervescences the blood. I think that's what that says, right? Du sang. Uh, right. I translated that, but it, it doesn't translate exactly in the context of and the effort, how we, the how we understand you know, the things today. But the idea that even though it was different, that they were experts in this in 1804 uh, is new, uh, that we have not discussed before and we have not looked at uh, before. And then here you see preparation de planche, uh, which is clearly English, uh, you know, uh, and, and it acknowledges, uh, you see anglais, boisson, uh, which is French for cocktail, boisson anglais, so English cocktail. Uh, they're talking about in 18, 1804. Uh, so I just want to introduce this to you guys, this idea, and to you know, put you on it and start looking, because uh, we all have to, if we're going to discover where we came from and what this history is, we all have to participate and look uh, into this. One cannot describe you know, uh, what New Orleans meant to the world in the first quarter of the 19th century. You know, it was the El Dorado uh, of the world. This picture, if you can see the boats, they went, there were hundreds of them, and they went as far as the eye can see. Uh, every traveler who came here uh, described this. You know, the Mississippi River was the great highway it did to it out of the United States. It goes from New Orleans all the way to Canada. And all of the goods in the United States that came, every rock waterway from the Rockies to the Alleghenies empties into the Mississippi River. It's actually possible to go from New York to New Orleans via water. Be a very obtuse route, but nonetheless uh, physically possible. And all of the goods that were coming into the United States and we had a different set of trade partners in New Orleans uh, than the Americans on the East Coast who traded with the English and the Dutch. Uh, we traded with the French and the uh, Itali uh, Spanish uh, in New Orleans. So we had a different range of ingredients, uh, trade partner partners available there. Uh, 
You know, in 1806, a young Bostonian uh, by the name of Frederick Tudor uh, went to Cuba with his brother uh, to take the cure for an injured leg. Uh, they loved uh, Havana until, like New Orleans, it got to be 98 degrees and 98% humidity outside. And uh, young Frederick started obsessing about how to keep cool. Being from Boston, uh, the winters were cold enough, the summers were mild enough, you could take a little bit of ice uh, and put it into your cellar in the heat of the summer, have something cold to drink. And he got the idea that he could sell cold drinks to people who lived in hot places. And he came back, 18 years old, uh, Boston, 1806, telling people he wanted to take a shipload of ice to Cuba to sell an ice business, start an ice business and sell cold drinks. And people thought he was insane, ridiculed him, but he managed to raise $10,000, which was an astronomical amount of he money. Go fund me, I think. Uh, of that age, bought a ship. Uh, in route, the mass breaks. Kickstarter, breaks. I'm sorry. It's I'm Kickstarter. sorry. Uh, <laughs> the mass breaks, 80% uh, of the cargo melts uh, when he gets there. People have nothing to do with the ice. They don't have refrigerators. Uh, they literally bring a bucket or a blanket and buy Sawdust. a piece of ice and Sawdust. watch it melt. Uh, that's later in the story. Uh, so, <laughs> so, so, uh, <laughs> uh but he does two things. Uh, one, he does ice cream demonstrations, which were quite the marvel to people who lived in hot places in the beginning of the 19th century. The other thing he does is he has what he calls his same price plan. He goes to bars and gives them a free supply of ice with a proviso that they sell their, for a week, uh, that they sell their drinks for the same price cold that they had sold them for hot, uh, based on the assumption that people who paid the same price for cold drinks uh, would never buy a hot drink again. And he meets with reasonable success, establishes markets in Martinique, Cuba, uh, comes home, and then President Jefferson is elected and declares the United States neutral in the Napoleonic Wars. So all of the markets that he had established in the Caribbean are no longer available to him. He comes back to Boston, he works on insulation, ultimately deciding on sawdust as the primary insulative material of the 19th century, becomes such a valuable commodity that they start mining sawdust from the millhouse floors of defunct sawmills. Uh, and then uh, at that point, uh, by the 1830s, uh, he's exporting ice from the United States to Hong Kong, uh, to India, uh, to uh, Buenos Aires and South America, uh, becomes one of the largest export crops in the United States. One of the most well-known Horatio Alger figures of the 19th century, who everybody in America uh, knew of, uh, Frederick Tudor, the Ice King. Uh, and, of course, when you become successful at something, then people start to uh, copy and imitate you. Uh, so that leads to the accelerated development of mechanical refrigeration. Uh, the very first mechanical ice plant in the United States was installed in New Orleans in 1867. It was a carrier plant, the same French company uh, who... President Trump boldly uh, made claims that he saved the jobs for uh, recently in Missouri, uh, but the same company. And that makes it possible for us to have regional breweries. Prior to that time, we were ale drinkers uh, because we were descendants of the English, uh, which were a warm fermented beers. Uh, Pilsners, lagers had to be cold fermented, so you could only make them in or climates, uh, regions where it was cold. When you have mechanical refrigeration, you can have regional breweries. And that's when we became lager and Pilsner drinkers as a result. Uh, a result of this. Uh, the ice cutting, people were obsessed uh, with ice. This is actually a picture where he was talking, uh, Spy Pond. Uh, this actually shows them uh, harvesting the ice. They ship the ice all throughout everywhere in the United States, uh, all around the world. Uh, quintessential American story to take something absolutely worthless, uh, mm. you know, frozen ice, uh, pond water, and sell it, around the, uh, sell it around the world. This shows where there are actually five different Tudor ice houses in New Orleans. Uh, New, New Orleans is the town, you know, where the ice business is large enough uh, that it assures his, the demand is large enough that it assures his ultimate success. Uh, this is actually a picture. Uh, you can see on the right, I don't know if you can read that sign of the first building, but that's the Fresh Pond Ice House uh, that's located uh, today. It's no longer there, uh, but that's located at the corner of Poitras and uh, St. Louis. Uh, the two drinks that he used to promote uh, the use of ice uh, were one, the mint julep, and the other, uh, the sherry cobbler. Sherry cobbler. Uh, in fact, straws uh, were invented to drink juleps with because we didn't have good dental care, and we would drink the ice, uh, it would hurt our teeth, uh, so we would take pasta. And we would uh, take wheat and straws, and we would drink. We were only single use, but ultimately straws became fashion accessories uh, that young bon vivants would go out and have a sterling or a silver straw. Uh, they would put it in their hat band. Uh, you'd walk into the bar, uh, pull your own uh, julep straw out, and uh, consume, your, uh, consume your beverage uh, with. Uh, 
From 1830 to 1840, New Orleans grew from 30,000 people to 100,000 people. And we had 40,000 people who came there annually to engage in commerce. In order to house this vast number of travelers, we literally had to invent a, a new form of architecture, uh, which we borrowed a European term called hotel, uh, and we called them hotels. Prior to that time, you stayed at an inn, which was somebody's house. And depending upon your social or economic status, it would determine how nice a house it was or where in the house you got to stay, uh, but it was a house nonetheless. The first modern hotel was built in the 1820s in Boston. It was called the Tremont House. It was 40 people, I mean, 40 rooms, uh, four stories tall. Uh, in the 1830s, they built the Astor House uh, in New York, which was 300 rooms. The same architect then comes to New Orleans. Uh, and collaborates and builds the St. Charles Hotel. This hotel cost $700,000 to build in 1838. Uh, it had 300 rooms. When we say hotel, all the things we recognize today, you have a lobby that you come into, you have a front desk uh, where you process check-ins, uh, you have an institutional dining room uh, for large numbers of people to eat, you have an institutional kitchen, you have segregated rooms, uh, wings of rooms. Uh, they had 20,000 gallon water tanks uh, they, there in 1838 dirty movies, though, on demand. Uh, yeah, they did. Uh, uh, they had 20,000 gallon tank, hot water tanks uh, that were on the roofs of this building uh, that provided hot running water to every room in the hotel in 1838. The bar, which was on the bottom entrance uh, below those columns, uh, was said to seat 800 men uh, at one time. The French and the Creoles, uh, seeing that history was filtered by, built a hotel in the French Quarter uh, to rival the St. Charles. It was called the St. Louis Hotel. It cost $1 million to build in 1838. Uh, Just to give you context, this, this building was destroyed by fire, but Antoine's is right over there. Uh, this is, um, this is uh, Royal Street runs that way. This is St. Louis. The Napoleon House is right there. Uh, there's a little bit of the wall of the St. Louis Hotel remaining right here. Over here is Antoine's, and Peixot's Pharmacy is, this is Royal Street, Peixot's Pharmacy was right there. But this is now the Omni uh, Orleans, Omni Royal Orleans Hotel. Um, so it's still a hotel, it's just no longer the St. Louis. So, so you see the Dome Rotunda here, you know. That's on St. Charles Avenue the, 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 Street. They also had a Dome Rotunda here. But this one you couldn't see from ground level. And in this room, imagine walking into a room like this, but it was eight stories tall, 80 feet. You know, and the bottom floor was where they held all of the auctions. Uh, that's actually another yeah, photograph that's Napoleon of the, House in the foreground. Of the St. Louis. This is in 1860 uh, with the Napoleon House directly across the uh, directly across the street. But in the rotunda, and this drawing is not absolutely architecturally accurate, but because on the second Chris was there on the uh, second floor of this room, <laughs> you can see the gray. Uh, they had a balcony, we call it a gallery, that circumnavigated the room. Half of that room was occupied by the bar, which was considered the greatest bar room in all the world. These five arches still exist today. If you walk out of the door in Napoleon House, you will see these. They're obviously not like the rest of the building. That's when they raised that building in 1915, uh, they left those five arches, and they sat there for the next 50 years. And when they built the uh, Romney Orleans in 1960, they included these arches into the chain wall of the original design. But this is actually part of the original 18th That's Charter Street looking towards St. Louis Cathedral and Jackson now, The Square. only bartender, and this is Jerry Thomas, the only bartender that Jerry Thomas mentions by name is he calls him Joseph Santina, well, Americans refusing to learn any foreign language, you know, always slur everything, uh, bastardize it. It was the Santini, Joseph Santini, not Santina. But he ran the bar at the St. Louis. Uh, and in, this is a picture of uh, Joseph Santini. Uh, he was accredited within Jerry Thomas with the invention of two <coughs> drinks. One, the Pousse Café, the multi-layered dessert drink, the other, Brandy Crusta. And when, and this is... You know, when uh, Gary Regan wrote his book, Joy of Mixology, it was before we had these digitized databases, he attempted to create a taxonomy of American drink. And this class of drinks, uh, where you modify using the sweetening agent as an orange-flavored liqueur, uh, Jerry, uh, I mean, Gary uh, described as uh, New Orleans sours. 
And this drink, if you go forward with it, uh, cognac, lemon juice, uh, curacao, maraschino, sugared rim glass, uh, paired lemon peel. If you go to the turn of the century to Paris, uh, omit the maraschino, substitute the curacao for triple sec, uh, you have uh, the sidecar. If you go 10 years into the future so to uh, Harry Craddock, uh, substitute the cognac for gin, you have the white lady. Uh, if you go into the 1940s, uh, substitute the gin with tequila uh, uh, and the lemon for lime, you have the margarita. And if you go to the 1990s and substitute the tequila for vodka and add a splash of cranberry, you have the cosmopolitan. And the cosmopolitan was singularly the most successful drink of the modern era because its template, its design, its DNA it is this classic drink form that reinvents itself and reappears in every generation as the defining drink of each, uh, of each generation. Uh, I focused on these two hotels because they're the center of life in New Orleans. Business life, cultural life. You see the scale, uh, the scale of them. Imagine them in a small town. Everything takes place. So Santini moves, and he moves opposite. He has a boulevard called the Jewel of the South, opposite the door of the, across the street from the St. Charles Hotel. This is actually a picture uh, of, that, uh, of that bar. I want you to remember this picture, though, because this picture was taken from a later era because it's the only picture I have in this building. But you see where it says stag bar. Can you see that where it says stag bar? Right there. All right. That, I just wanted you to remember that. It was later purchased by Tom Anderson. He was called the boss of Storyville. Uh, he owned uh, Anderson's. Uh, this is actually Storyville, those mansions, that's all of the famous brothels in Storyville. Uh, he was a state legislator, a politician, uh, uh, as bartenders often, uh, often were. And he then sells that bar uh, later to, well, we'll come to that. This is Henry Ramos. Uh, Ramos uh, gets Santini's bar, not the jewel, but Santini has the whole bar corner block, and he gets Santini's old stand, the Imperial Cabinet, and buys that from Tom Anderson. This is actually the corner of Gravier and Carondelet. That is the Ramus Bar. You can see downstairs where it says Ramus. Uh, this is where the one and only one is sold, uh, opposite the St. Charles, 712 Gravier Street. This is Ramus and his crew. Uh, I'm going to now move on to the Sazerac, and this is going to be the end of my little part of this. But this is the Merchants Exchange. And, you know, there are a lot of people who look at this stuff. There's a lot of confusion, you know, uh, about the chain of a uh, title to the Sazerac, all of the different owners. You know, when you're talking about the Sazerac, what are you talking about? Are you talking about the drink? Are you talking about the bar? Or are you talking about the people who worked at the bar? And all three of those are all different storylines that different people look at in various contexts. This is from 1845. This is when Sewell Taylor was there. The bottom floor, one half, and I don't know which half, one half was Taylor's Exchange Bar, the other half was the post office. And in that era, when you wrote a letter, they put it in the paper. No, you've got a letter to pick up at the post office. So everybody in the city who came to the post office would walk into the bar. This is actually depicting the bar. I can't tell if, how's the pointer work, Phil? Oh, uh, which button? It's this one. All right. I can't tell if that's the bar and there's somebody sitting at it or all these people coming in and out of the bar. But that is actually Taylor's Bar that you're looking uh, at. And I just wanted to put this in as an aside. Uh, uh, Washington Dixon was yesterday brought into the office in a most filthy and bloody condition charged by Sewell Taylor of the Merchants Exchange Bar Room with being drunk and disturbing the peace of his house. It appeared that fellow Dixon insulted some gentleman there, whereupon the gentleman gave him a good thrashing. What an <laughs> ass this guy had to have been to have gotten his butt kicked, and then the owner of the bar took him to jail too. Uh, wasn't enough. This is something none of you have ever seen, nobody has ever seen. That's the Sazerac Bar. Uh, that's actually a, a period a representation of the exterior of the bar. You can see the Merchants Exchange uh, uh, to the left. Uh, Taylor has a lease at the Merchants Exchange uh, from 1840 uh, to 1849. In 1849, he loses his lease. Uh, he moves out of the Merchants Exchange. Uh, he opens a wholesale uh, liquor store across the street, and he has a retail store here where he has his clerk, Aaron Bird, uh, managing it for him. The first time we see Sazerac in our papers uh, associated with the name Barr uh, is in 1855. Uh, with Aaron Bird paying for the licenses uh, of the bar itself, uh, but he was running the bar for uh, for Taylor. Let's show uh, this that's is actually on. an interior view of the Sazerac Bar in the pre-prohibition uh, period. 
20 uh, cents. This, uh, as to the phylloxera debate, uh, you know, certainly true phylloxera uh, epidemic occurred. Uh, it was certainly true there were diminished uh, stocks of cognac, but we don't make cognac today and uh, to sell tomorrow. Uh, you know, the cognac that we sell today uh, is made from aged uh, stocks and reserves. This was the most exclusive bar in the city. Uh, wealthy men uh, consumed there. When, this is the inventory of the Sazerac bar at the time of Handy's death. Uh, in 1896, and uh, right here we see uh, old Sazerac brandy. Uh, they had it at the bar, it just cost more. Uh, and then uh, this is actually the business card of William Wilkerson, who uh, twice in his lifetime in the newspapers uh, was credited with the invention of the Sazerac, uh, and after his death. Uh, was credited with the eviction of the Sazerac. He died in 1904. Uh, he came to work there in the mid-1870s. Uh, that clearly dates uh, the invention of the Sazerac cocktail itself. Uh, and we had had, you know, in the 1845, uh, the improved brandy cocktail appear in our newspaper, uh, cognac, uh, uh, sugar, absinthe. Uh, Can I, and, real quick? And then finally, uh, this is uh, the last thing. Uh, this is an, uh, three recipes uh, from the great-great-grandson of Christopher O'Reilly, who was the owner of the Sazerac Company. Uh, this is actually a Sazerac recipe. Uh, and these are bulk quantities. This is for their bottled cocktails uh, that they sold. Uh, but you see both Angostura and Peixos bitters, uh, and it substitutes maraschino, which dates it sometime between 1912 when the absinthe ban occurred uh, and 1919 when prohibition uh, came into uh, place. And then finally, uh, this is the Sazerac Bar at the corner of Gravier and Carondelet. So in this same location, this one building, you have Santini, you have Ramos, and you have the Sazerac Bar, all three occupying the same physical location at three different periods in, uh, at three different periods in history. And then in 1949, one of the consequences of prohibition uh, was that you couldn't have be a wholesaler and a retailer. So one of Mr. Goldring's competitors brought a legal action of him, against him. He had to divest himself of one, so he licensed the name for the retail component to the then Roosevelt Hotel. Uh, that's how the drink comes to be associated with that hotel. Uh, now it's a little park. They put the fence up, but we're dog shit. Uh, there's <laughs> nothing there commemorating the fact that, you know, uh, the uh, story of American drink was played out on the stage of this, uh, of this corner. Uh, and that's my part of it. Uh, <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, real quick though, it's, it's, it's a little tricky when you look at his business card, Sazerac Cocktails, it was a brand of bottled cocktails. So you can see that under this brand you could buy whiskey cocktails, Manhattan cocktails, and martini cocktails. Clearly they're not Sazeracs, but Sazerac was a brand name that was applied to bottled cocktails. So it's sometimes a little tricky are we talking about a bottled Sazerac, or are we talking about a, a bottled cocktail, it could be a Manhattan or a Martini, that came under the, fla the flagship brand of Sazerac? So uh, they initially, when they initially released the bottled cocktail line, the Sazerac cocktail was not included, but I do have an ad from 1900 uh, that advertising the bottled cocktails as the Sazerac cocktail is the drink that's making New Orleans famous. So they're talking about the cocktail itself. And while we don't see recipes for the Sazerac until the first decade of the 20th century, we, the drink was already famed by that point. Uh, there's an exchange between the mayor of New Orleans and the mayor of Seattle, where the mayor of New Orleans goes to Seattle and talks about how weak the cocktails are there, unlike our Sazerac cocktail. And the mayor of Seattle responds and you know, how good the Seattle, they have a back and forth over the course of the week. But the drink was widely disseminated throughout the country and widely famed by the time it started to appear in cocktail, uh, in cocktail books. Well, we're going we're gonna to stop talking at this moment, but uh, I want to thank our sponsors, Peixos Aperitivo, Peixos Bitters, Sazerac Rye, uh, the uh, Pierre Ferrand uh, 1840 Cognac, and of course, Herb Saint um, in the drinks. Uh, Chris and Chris, thank you. It's always an honor and, to work and, with and you. And you guys for, and, and you all for coming listening today. listening to so. our obsessions here. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. All right, well, thank you again. Uh, uh, the, the, yeah, the next seminar is at 1.30, but uh, come, come see us afterwards if you have any individual questions. I have a couple copies of, of my two books, The Hemingway Cocktail Companion, To Have and Have Another, as well as my Manhattan book. Uh, they're, they're out here for sale uh, from Cocktail Kingdom. Uh, I'd be happy to sign them, or you can buy them directly from me. 
But thank you again for coming out today and enjoy the rest of Tales. Uh, it's really an honor to be here. Thank you. And thank you, Chris.